Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the Tuesday, January 16th meeting of the Local Government Land Use and Tribal Affairs Committee. We have an incredibly packed agenda today with a number of measures. Uh, so we are gonna have staff read in the first bill, which is Senate Bill 5955. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Maggie Douglas, committee staff. Before you is Senate Bill 5955, relating to mitigating harm and improving equity in large port districts. By way of background, a port district that operates an airport serving more than 900 scheduled jet aircrafts per day may operate a program of aircraft noise abatement within impacted areas. These programs generally focus on reducing the noise produced by the aircraft while on the ground, during takeoff and landings, and during flights over populated areas. A port district may establish a fund for purposes of the noise abatement program. The bill before you today requires a port district authorized to undertake noise abatement programs to first undertake a remedial mitigation program and second to establish a process for significant port actions. The remedial mitigation program must include the following for the impacted area. The repair or replacement of failed mitigation equipment, the provision of sound and air mitigation equipment to residential, recreational, or educational facilities, and the provision of indoor community greenhouses, indoor recreation facilities available to the community, or programs to provide urban forest or green space. A property may qualify for an individual benefit under this program if the property meets certain criteria, including whether the property has been determined by an inspection to have been provided mitigation equipment that failed. A port district must, either by interlocal agreement or contract, provide building inspectors to conduct inspections. Commerce must administer a grant program to provide financial assistance to qualifying port districts for purposes of providing building inspectors and must publish an annual report detailing grants made under the program. A port district required to undertake a remedial mitigation program must prepare a document detailing government assistance programs available to assist property owners should an inspector find deficiencies on a property. A port district may use monies in the noise abatement fund to comply with the requirements of this bill, including funds from any grants or loans made by the Port District Environmental Equity Fund and the following property tax levy revenue. After July 1st, 2024, at least half of the dollar amount of the district's levy revenue over the prior year's levy, and after July 1st, 2025, at least 1% of a port district's annual tax levy revenue. A port district must dedicate an additional 1% of its annual tax levy revenue per year for a maximum of 10%. The Port District Environmental Equity Fund established by this bill may be supplemented by monies from the Climate Commitment Act or Climate Commitment Account. Commerce must provide management services for the fund and prepare an annual report detailing the grants and the loans made under the fund and the benefits that have been realized. This fund may be used to make loans or grants to port districts to undertake remedial mitigation programs or to comply with the requirements of this bill, including the approval of significant port actions. Prior to approving a significant port action, a port district must conduct an assessment on the likely adverse cumulative impact of the proposed action on the overburdened communities and vulnerable populations, provide a written explanation of actions that the district is taking to minimize the likely adverse impacts or provide a clear explanation of why it has determined that it is unable to minimize the impacts, and finally consult with an overburdened communities and vulnerable populations about the proposed action. Significant port actions are defined as any action involving a capital improvement project, purchase, or construction of more than $12 million in value. And finally, beginning February 1st, 2026, a port district must produce an annual report detailing the funds that were required to be used on remedial mitigation programs and significant port actions. A fiscal note was requested but is not yet available, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions for staff? All right, Senator Kaiser, why don't you come tell us about your bill?
And I want to thank you again for having this hearing. I want to make clear, and I want to thank the staff for that very comprehensive and accurate briefing as well. It's very helpful when we have such great professional staff. This bill will only apply to SeaTac International Airport. It is written to specifically apply to a certain type of air facility. It doesn't apply to other ports or other facilities. And it applies to SeaTac in particular because that's in my backyard and my community and my seatmates and I have been meeting with the Port of Seattle for years. Senator Short, I'd say it's sort of like the PBM issue. It just goes on and on and on. We get assurances, we get words, we get nice discussions. We don't get what we need, which is remediation. The tens of thousands of people in my communities are subjected 24-7 to noise pollution and air pollution that's specific to jet engines. It's called ultra-fine particles. These ultra-fine particles have been measured by the University of Washington study to be found in throughout the pattern of landing and takeoffs in our airport communities. And that's about a 10-mile circumference around the port. Those uh, particles are so small, they can pass the blood-brain barrier. They can get into a placenta. They are, I believe, one of the reasons why the health measures in our community are so bad. The uh, Seattle King County Health Department did a report to the legislature outlining that we have a lower life expectancy, we have higher rates of asthma, respiratory, and heart disease. And um, people living closest to the airport have a life expectancy that's about five years less than the rest of King County. Well, this bill proposes a pattern of ongoing remediation and repair. A uh, long time ago, some uh, residences were given what's called a port package, which was insulation and windows to mitigate for noise. Many of these port packages are now failing. These homeowners gave the airport a permanent avigation easement, but they refused to repair the failed port packages. And we have people living with mold in the windows because they are leaking. So that has to be remediated, it has to be repaired, but nobody wants to pay for it. So we're putting forward a process here where we can develop both a combination of Climate Commitment Act funding for some of the air pollution mitigations with air filtrations in our schools and daycares, and a, um, a package of uh, revenue that would extend by using a portion of the port's property tax increase. And it is a 10-year plan because this doesn't happen in a one-off kind of way. It needs to be an ongoing plan, not just a one budget cycle kind of approach. So that's my um, explanation of where, uh, why I put forward this bill and why my community is here to testify in favor of it. So I would uh, really beg your indulgence to hear their stories. We absolutely will, Senator Kaiser. Do we have any questions for our prime sponsor? All right, we look forward to a robust hearing. Thank you. With that, we're going to suspend the public hearing on Senate Bill 5955, and we're going to open the public hearing on Senate Bill 6029, establishing limitations on detached ADUs. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Maggie Douglas, committee staff. Before you is Senate Bill 6029 relating to establishing limitations on detached accessory dwelling units outside the urban growth area. By way of background, any city or county fully planning under the GMA must ensure that within a UGA, local development regulations allow for the construction of ADUs. Cities and counties may apply certain regulations to ADUs, including the generally applicable development regulations and permitting requirements and restrictions on the use of ADUs for short-term rentals. In addition, cities and counties may prohibit the construction of ADUs that are not connected to or served by public sewers or that are located in residential zones with a density of one dwelling unit per acre or less that are within areas designated as wetlands, fish and wildlife habitats, floodplains, or geologically hazardous areas. A city or county may not authorize the construction of an ADU in a location where development is restricted under other laws, rules, or ordinances as a result of physical proximity to on-site sewage system infrastructure, 
critical areas, or other unsuitable physical characteristics of a property. The bill before you today requires counties to allow detached ADUs outside of UGAs if the units are subject to certain development regulations. This includes that the detached ADU is cited to prevent the loss of land designated as agricultural or forest land, is located within the same acre and uses the same driveway as the primary dwelling unit, is subject to current water supply requirements, and does not exceed a floor area of 1,296 square feet and what would otherwise be authorized by the county as an expansion of the primary dwelling unit. An applicant must provide documentation that the sewage or septic system is capable of handling the additional demand placed on the system by the ADU. A parcel may not have more than one attached or detached ADU and may not be subdivided for the purposes of avoiding the limits on the development regulations established by this act. Counties may allow detached ADUs by adopting development regulations that are substantially similar to those in effect as of January 1st, 2024. I'm multitasking here. I'm Senator Hunt, we can tell you're multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, please proceed. Counties may allow detached ADUs by adopting development regulations that are substantially similar to those in effect as of January 1st, 2024, in a county with a population exceeding 2 million. A fiscal note was not requested, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for staff? All right, with that, we'd like to welcome a very special testifier today because we know that it's a very special day for him. So I would like to ask the indulgence of our committee space to uh, welcome Senator Braun and to sing him happy birthday that's this not, day. That's not fair. If everyone would please join me. I withdraw. <laughs> Wow. Wow. I, and many more. Yeah. Thank you so much for bringing this bill to us. Well, well thank, thanks for having me, Madam Chair. Um, that's, I certainly did not expect that. So I might have planned better had I expected that. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I, I appreciate hearing the bill. Uh, this is a, a pretty simple bill. It's a bill, it's similar to bills you've heard before, um, but it's a bill that I still think is worth pursuing and thinking about. The one change from Bill I think you heard last year is it does further restrict this development of the detached ADUs to the same acre as the current residents. And the reason this is important in rural communities is we continue to see a significant migration uh, within our state and from outside our state into our rural areas. And uh, or it, it's causing, uh, you know, we've been for many years have had housing challenges in our urban areas. Now we absolutely have them in our rural areas and frankly have less ability to deal with them because we don't have the the, the density options that you have in a, an urban area. This is a small thing. Uh, it addresses some of the problem. It's not, not one, there's no one solution to our housing problem, but this would just take some of the pressure off our rural areas. The other thing I would share is that <clears throat> is absent that this, you know, folk, our citizens are inventive and they find, they'll find other ways to go around this. A common one is to park a, a, an RV next to a house, you know, and maybe, you know, then the county will try to regulate that. But there's there's limits to what you can really do. I think a much more, uh, more long, a be, much better long-term solution is say, hey, you can do this development, provide very specific guidance that you do it in a way that doesn't affect uh, the land use, that doesn't affect, you know, access from the transportation transportation system that, that stays within the uh, water requirements and the sewer requirements. So you have a lot better, uh, more sustainable, more environmentally friendly development uh, and helps, uh, and, but does help take a little bit of pressure off the system. So I just ask you can, to consider this as an option for rural areas to give a, provide a little bit of relief to some of the pressure we see on housing in, in rural areas. So thank you very much for considering it. I, I didn't go through all the details. Uh, Maggie did a great job of explaining it. So straightforward bill, uh, biggest change from the, a bill you heard, I think, last year, mm -hmm. and uh, is the is the re further requirement to keep it, you know, within that single acre around the existing housing unit. 
I thank you, Senator Braun. I really appreciate you bringing this bill forward again this year. It's an important conversation to be having. This is probably a question for Maggie. Is there any provisions around having some kind of administrative set aside? I mean, one of the challenges that we hear with the rural ADUs is enforcement of making sure that people are upholding building codes, et cetera. And it, obviously, in these rural county areas, they can often be, you know, fairly, you know, pretty substantial distance from the actual city um, county seat that would have the the planning department. Do you, is there anything, any such provision? Um, I'm not aware off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to review the bill and get back to you. Okay, thank yeah, you so much. I'm happy to look into that as well. I mean, if that, if that helps make this more workable, we're happy to work on it. Okay, excellent. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And thanks happy birthday. The, thanks for the warm reception. <laughs> All right, with that, we're going to suspend the public hearing on Senate Bill 6029, and we're going to open the public hearing on Senate Bill 5970. If staff could please read in the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Karen Epps, staff to committee. Before you is Senate Bill 5970, modifying local Board of Health County Commissioner membership. By way of background, counties are charged with establishing either a county health department or a health district to assure the public's health. Each local public health jurisdiction is governed by a local board of health. For counties without a home room rule charter, the board is compri comprised of the board of county commissioners and unelected members from the following three categories that must be approved by a majority vote of the board of county commissioners. These include public health practitioners, employees of healthcare facilities, and healthcare providers, consumers of public health, which includes residents that have self-identified as having faced significant health inequities or as having lived experiences with public health related programs and other community stakeholders. The, um, if federally recognized Indian tribes hold reservation trust lands or have usual and accustomed areas within the county, or if a 501c3 organization is registered in Washington that serves American Indian Alaska native people and provides services within the county, the board must include a tribal representative selected by the American Indian Health Commission. The number of the members selected from the three categories and the tribal representative must equal the number of city and county elected officials on the board. This bill authorizes the Board of County Commissioners in counties without a home rule charter and where there are five commissioners to adopt an ordinance reducing the number of co county commissioners that are members of the local Board of Health provided that the local Board of Health includes at least one county commissioner. A fiscal note was not requested, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Senator Short has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Karen, so can you identify, so I think Spokane would be under this. I believe yeah. it applies to Spokane and Thurston counties. Okay, thank you. Yes, and, and for the benefit of the, the public and, and members, you know, this is just a, a series of kind of cleanup bills to help out with the fact that um, Thurston County, you know, changed their their charter or updated their charter, and so they have new new membership. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome our prime sponsor, uh, Senator Hunt. Are you with us, Senator Hunt? <laughs> Am I talking to myself again? No, no, no. You're here with us, li live and and in per and and uh, remote. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Okay. Well, as I say, Sam Hunt, State Senator, Twenty Second District, Thurston County just went to uh, three from three to five county commissioners because our population is over 300,000. However, statutes for non-charter counties basically are written for three member boards of commissioners, and we had to tweak a couple statutes last year and now this one. This bill only affects Thurston County. The other five counties have a population of over 500,000, excuse me, 300, but four of them are charter counties, King, Pierce, Snohomish, and Clark. And Spokane has a public health district, so none of those counties are affected by this change. So it just addresses the uh, Board of Health in the Thurston County uh, situation and none of the other counties in the state, and I hope you'll vote for it. Thank you so much, Senator Hunt. Any questions for our prime sponsor? 
All right, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, with that, we're gonna suspend the public hearing on Senate Bill 5970, and now we're just gonna go right down the roster. So we're gonna reopen the public hearing on Senate Bill 5955 uh, related to airport districts. Uh, and we're gonna begin with our first panel, which is J.C. Harris, Council Member Nagus, and Kyle Moore. Uh, we have a lot of remote, uh, a combination of remote and in-person testifiers. There's gonna be 90 seconds on the clock. Uh, for our remote testifiers, please make sure that you're in gallery view so that you can see the timer. Uh, because we have a packed agenda, once that light goes red, your time is up. Uh, so, J.C. Welcome, I see you're here as we promote our other testifiers. Uh, the next panel will be John Flanagan, Eric Fitch, and John Worthington. So John, please look out for a, a request to promote. And welcome. Thank you, my name is J.C. Harris, I live in Des Moines. I'm a member of the Des Moines City Council, a licensed engineer. But today I represent SeaTac Noise.info, a community group that has visited and documented hundreds of homes with failed port packages. All the airport communities were meant as the original affordable housing, places for families to raise children and live the middle-class American dream. The moment SeaTac began its relentless expansions in the 70s, that became impossible without sound insulation. There is a huge shortage of housing stock, and a port package is no luxury. It is as necessary to safety and health as any proper building code. When so many homes are devalued, made unhealthy, when so many port packages fail, it further reduces the opportunity for families, increasingly BIPOC families like mine, to live that dream. So first and foremost, this is housing justice. This idea was first proposed in the 70s after the SeaTac Communities Plan, creating the first sound insulation and environmental mitigation programs. The quote from the port at the time was, as we do better, you'll do better. Somehow that promise was lost. On behalf of hundreds of homes with failed port packages, I ask you to fulfill that promise and pass Senate Bill 5955. This is the justice. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Neguse. Hello, Chair. I actually um, am here with a resident who also had signed up for public testimony, um, and, but their name is not showing up as a list as a panelist. Okay. Well, please proceed. Just be sure time? to introduce yourself for the record. Okay. My name is Sanait Naguse, SeaTac City Council member, and I'm here with Mr. Trung Lee, um, who is a SeaTac resident. And we are here appearing before you and, and advocating for Senate Bill 5955. Um, I've engaged with thousands of residents on this issue, and we are happy to be here today to bring this paramount concern. Our residents, like Mr. Lee and his wife, have been SeaTac residents for several decades. They received insulation packages back in 2000, and those have failed um, immensely um, since. Um, these failed insulation packages have led to mold in the windows and um, many of our residents who are living on fixed incomes lack the means to rectify these challenges caused by the port and their contractors. Since 1985, the port has undertaken efforts to insulate the over 9,000 windows, but many of them have failed um, due to the poor insulation and ineffective soundproofing. Our airport stands as the economic engine of our region. While everybody benefits, our residents are the ones who have to deal with the repercussions. And so today I'm urging you um, to support our residents um, in supporting this bill with the passage of 5955. Um, San Francisco has a great example of three programs um, and two which allow for reinstallation of um, packages. One of the programs, notably the Repair Replacement Initiative, allows for um, uh, reinstallation of failed packages, and this is 100% funded by the airport and not the FAA. And their other programs consist of a combination of airport dollars as well as FAA grants. These are the type of programs that we would like to see here in SeaTac and our neighboring cities. Um, this is the type of program that this bill would lead to at SeaTac International Airport. I envision a scenario in my city where Mr. Lee and his wife, along thousands of residents, are able to look outside of their window. He does not have that luxury at this moment due to the fog, the mold, um, and have proper sound insulation. The current packages are failed. 
There's subpar installation, flawed port packages, and we're asking you um, to support our residents so that they can enhance their quality of living. And so I'll um, give the rest of the time to uh, Mr. Lee to um, share a little bit about his experiences with the port. Yes, please do keep in mind we've already given you an extra 90 Thank seconds, you. so <laughs> try to keep it brief, please. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lee. Hi, my name is uh, Leong. I have uh, lived in the street that homeowner who have the uh, failed port market. I am terrified for the center bill 5955. I received the popular on the 2000. And with the first decade, the pop market beginning to fail. <coughs> Back on the early 2010, I have much attempt to contact them for the from my, uh, the work also the folk of the Seattle who was in charge for isolation of the pork packet. I will see the contact folk with the fail packet. It's been more than a decade, and I still have not seen it. And it fit the window. The problem was eight years ago when my loved wife shot for stroke and I have to care early retirement to become my wife full part to care her. To my wife, medical reason, my wife and I now spend 99% for our living indoor. This is beginning how far we can even see out our window. Do the seal failing in the pop pocket window. The window plot have a lot more food considering and we isn't able to open the window to get the pet air do the concern. I'm so sorry. We're we're out of time, but I do hope that you will please make sure to submit your comments in writing as well. And Senator Kaiser has also shared some photographs from your house. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Kyle Moore. Good morning, Chair Lovett and committee members. My name is Kyle Moore. I'm head of government relations at the city of SeaTac. I'm here to testify in favor of Senate Bill 5955. The airport comprises 42% of our city, and my residents are the most impacted by noise and pollution from the aircraft operations. In fact, more than 1,000 flights pass over my residents' homes each day. My residents are also some of the most impoverished in the Puget Sound area and don't necessarily have the means to pay for ch uh, changes to these port packages and upgrades. Uh, in fact, uh, over the past 40 years, the port has installed noise packages in about 9,500 homes. However, current FAA policy restricts airports from using federal funds to upgrade or repair noise insulation other than in homes that received these packages pre-1993. We believe strongly that homes located in and around the airport need to have these failed insulation packages redone and these uh, warranties honored. My city has been advocating at the federal level to have the FAA dedicate funds to this reinstallation program. I traveled to D.C. with Representative Tina Orwell, Representative David Hackney, Port Commissioner Mohammed Hamdi, and other elected officials from six cities surrounding the airport to advocate for more federal funding to mitigate aircraft noise and emissions. However, as we know, the federal government moves at a glacier's pace compared to the state. I believe that SB 5955 can be in addition to any federal funds that are directed by the FAA, and I would like to thank Senator Kaiser for her hard work, and please vote yes on SB 5955. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right, our next panel is John Flanagan, Eric Fitch, and joining us remotely is John Worthington. I'll just get started. Uh, thank you, Chair Lovelett, Ranking Member Torres, members of the committee. Uh, good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is John Flanagan, Senior State Government Relations Manager for the Port of Seattle, uh, testifying today with some opposition to Senate Bill 5955. Uh, the Port of Seattle appreciates the focus this bill brings to the issues faced by near port communities. Uh, the Port has worked for years with our near airport communities to create opportunities for engagement and discussions around the issues related to the airport. This includes one of the country's most robust and longstanding sound insulation programs in alignment with FAA regulations and guidelines, creation of the South King County Community Impact Fund, 
and the convening of the SEA Stakeholder Advisory Roundtable, or START. Uh, the bill before you today poses a number of significant concerns to the port because as drafted, it runs contrary to FAA regulations, could violate constitutional prohibitions against gift to public funds, and requires the port to take various actions without necessarily providing us the legal authority to do so. Current draft also sets up several new and expanded programs without providing financial resources to make those programs successful. A uh, similar proposal introduced in a prior session that only contemplated expanded noise mitigation, obviously a much smaller scope than this bill, was actually estimated to cost billions at the time. Um, due to the way the bill is constructed, none of the necessary funding could come from federal resources and must come solely from non-airport revenue or from state funds. Um, I'll stop at the criticism there and just say, we've met with the sponsor multiple times to express concerns, but also to highlight areas of potential agreement and compromise on the bill. Last Friday, we shared an amended version of the bill uh, that the port would support, which included directing state resources towards the inspections of so-called failed noise packages and creating a program to pay for inspections and to put resources towards repairing and replacing failed packages. We want to work to find compromise in this bill and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lovelet, Ranking Member Torres, members of the committee. I'm Eric Fitch, the Executive Director at the Washington Public Ports Association. Association here with concerns about Senate Bill 5955. First, the legislation fails to consider the robust investment the port has made for decades in near port communities. That includes hundreds of millions spent on thousands of homes to mitigate for sound impacts. In addition, the port is a national leader in environmental mitigation, not just the South King County Fund that John mentioned, but continued leadership on the deployment of sustainable aviation fuels. Um, second, and important to my members, the bill challenges the independent management of an essential public facility by a local government, ports manage transportation facilities to pr promote trade, economic development, and to move people. This bill brings the state into that business and into the port's own budgeting work. And finally, as I mentioned, the SeaTac Airport is currently funded entirely by federal grants and by the revenues derived at the facility. The bill devotes the port's King County tax levy to airport operations, countering 70 years of precedent. Happy to take questions, and like John said, I'm glad to hear there are positive conversations with the bill sponsor. Thank you so much for joining us. I have a question. You know, I think there's some uh, confusion as to how you end up with a failed package or how you would determine, you know, the metrics on that. Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, I, one of the previous uh, testifiers mentioned uh, the program running at SFO in San Francisco. I, I'll be really clear. I mean, no airports in the country besides SFO are doing any kind of remediation for failed packages. So this is a brand new area that everyone's stepping into here. Um, in the amended bill that we offered back to Senator Kaiser and uh, Representative Orwell in the House, uh, we talk about hiring uh, qualified building inspectors and honestly contracting for, for the services to be performed. So it'd be, it'd be a two, two portions of an assessment. One would be assessing whether or not the sound mitigation equipment is working properly by testing the actual sound in a home. But then two, as some folks have talked about here today, uh, assessing whether or not an improperly installed package has led to some sort of hazard or damage to the structure of the home. In, in that case, I believe they were talking about mold. So it'd be, it would be hiring for inspection services to find those two things, if that makes sense. Any other questions for our port panel? All right, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, John, are you here with us? I am, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, oh, just, I just want to make sure the next panel knows who's up. Uh, we'll be welcoming Tracy Buxton, Ann Croker, and Steve Edmondson. But John, please go ahead. John Worthington, Squim. I used to live in SeaTac for good a, a long time. Uh, they've known since the 80s about the, the five-mile radius. Uh, but the planners and uh, the county and the city, they just kept moving people in there. That's because the Department of Health in 1999 said that there weren't excess cancers right there. So the lawsuit is frivolous. It's a bad bill. It's a bad bill, and it's frivolous because the Department of Health is to blame for that 1999 study. Why would you know about a five-mile radius in 1980 and increase your population by 30 percent that was a bad move they knew about it they're the liable party so you got a five mile radius of 300,000 people you need them out of there they should have already been out of there and the only reason they're there is because you passed a sound transit initiative in 1996 and then the growth management was all in full swing and they wanted that urban density increase at the peril of the old banner uh, communities. And I have problems when the ICLEI, an international group, promotes this solution. I have a problem when cities like SeaTac join the ICLEI to build capacity for India and China. What better way? What's next, Soros? 
I'm your Huckleberry. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, uh, Tracy, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Lovelett and Ranking Member Torres and other members of the committee. I am Des Moines Mayor Tracy Buxton, and Des Moines strongly supports this bill. First, I'd like to take a moment to consider our history in the Northwest. Beginning about 200 years ago with the Lewis and Clark expedition, westward expansion included the Oregon Trail, railroads, military securing of the entire Salish Sea, and the creation of port districts, all with a shared objective, the nurturing and protection of commerce and trade in this state and for the nation. Today, we find ourselves at a crossroads. We are the closest port to Asia and globally connected center of commerce and trade for the entire country. Last year, we attempted to secure this vibrant economic future by locating a second commercial airport, but we were stopped dead in our tracks. Why? Because residents don't recognize the benefits of an airport neighbor. They only see harm. If we're to honor 200 years of deep sacrifice and investment, and sustainably protect the residents who receive the impacts of this vibrant economy, it starts at SeaTac. Thank you. Oh, bottom order. Um, <laughs> um, my name is Ann Craker. I'm a. Oh, thank you. That helps. Um, my name is Ann Craker, and I am a resident of Des Moines, and I thank my city's uh, representatives, council, and uh, Senator Kaiser, who have put together this very needed bill to help our South King County communities. Um, while I live 10 miles south, it's still part of this long um, uh, city of Des Moines, and the, we have two flights over us, uh, and they've they are every minute and a half to two minutes, and they go from uh, all day, and there's a small break between 12 and 5 when only two cargo planes go over, and there are two paths. And I talk about this because uh, while we will have to move after 10 years and even being in an energy efficient house with triple pane windows, um, we can't go outside without feeling and he even still hearing inside. But what I would like to uh, um, advocate is for all the other community members uh, who have been here longer than we have, um, have lived with all of this issue, continue to, the port will still grow, and no, no mediation, no mitigation has been uh, uh, undertaken for um, these folks, um, everyone is responsible for this air travel pollution, whether you fly yourself, whether you have packages, whether you have people visit, whether it's you know people who work there. Um, we all have to take care of our fossil fuel infrastructure and our um, and and uh, the pollution that it, it uh, provides and long term the climate emissions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Steve Edmiston. I live in the city of Des Moines, uh, 58 out of my 62 years in Des Moines. So I've been under the flight paths or adjacent flight paths for a very long time. Um, I've become an activist. Uh, uh, I am someone who is subjected to those 400,000 flights a year. I'm grateful to my senator and my representative uh, for bringing this bringing these bill this bill forward. Um, I've been on a lot of aviation committees and commissions. Most recently, I was on the, the commission to cite a new airport that we all know didn't succeed. Um, and, and one of my learnings from that commission I think is relevant, and that is this. Um, someday, another community might decide that it wants both the benefits and the burdens of a major international uh, airport. But that day is not today. And on the commission, we learned that day is 40 years away or more. So I think it's a matter of fundamental fairness that we pass a bill like this to take care of those that are actually receiving 100% of the burden from our state. Um, I'm about to run out of time. I want to give you three numbers. One is $1 billion. That's the budget of revenue for Port of Seattle this coming year, 0.001, one thousandth, that's the amount that this bill will cost the Port of Seattle this year. It's a matter of fundamental fairness. And the last number is zero. Zero homes outside the tiny federal contour have ever received a port package in all the neighbor cities. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Any questions for this panel? Oh, oh. All right.
Thank you. <laughs> All right, so our next uh, our next panel is going to be Carl Schrader, Katie Chapman C, and Mike Mormon. Uh, next on deck is going to be Wendy Leonard, Randy Boucher, and Sandra Mock. You're not. All right. Well, I'll take you off of that. How about Katie Katie Chapman C? Maybe we got a little mix up on our list here. Nope. I was wondering, you guys seemed like an interesting panel to call up. All right, so let's go ahead and let's let's move on. Hopefully this one, we hopefully got this one. Uh, Wendy Leonard, Randy Boucher, and Sandra Mock. All right, let's go with those guys. And then next we have a remote panel. It'll be Brian Davis, Heather Morton, and Barbara McMichael. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome. Who's first? Oh, hi, my name is Sandra Mock and I live in Des Moines. I'm a realtor and I also own an Airbnb in Des Moines. And um, I'm here to ask for help. We need your help, we really do. All of the homes that I go to in Des Moines when I'm showing homes, every single port package has failed. In the last five years, I have not gone into one home where it is sustained. Not one. And something else you might need to know is when we were given these port packages, nobody came in and inspected them to make sure that they were installed correctly. And that's why a lot of us have mold in our homes. We need remediation. We need help. I can tell you that I have more cancer clients than I've ever seen in my life in the 26 years that I've been doing business. And it's ridiculous because we have more than 900 flights going over our heads every single day. And we are literally dying for your help. I lost my husband six years ago. He had a brain bleed and died in my arms. And two years later, who came out with a study about what noise and pollution affects us? You at Dub has come out with a fine particulate study. And I cannot help but wonder if my being a widow could have been changed had we received mitigation. So I'm asking you, don't make us die more for help. Help us now. Thank you. Sorry for your loss. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I understand Wendy Leonard uh, is no longer in the Zoom room. Uh, is Randy Boucher here? Yes. Oh, all right, welcome. Go ahead, Randy. My name is Randy Boucher. I live in SeaTac, Washington. Um, in 2016, I went to paint my house, and that's when I noticed that um, 60 to 70 percent of all my uh, window sills or rotted, allowing water to go in between the walls of my home. Um, also, I have mold growing in between the windows. So I'm asking if, if this panel would like, if they could invite the panel to come to my home and take a look for yourselves. I'm confident that once you see the condition of my house and the windows, that you will agree that the workmanship that the initial install was extremely poor. In 2020, Washington legislator has passed the bill HB 2315. This bill was to fix these problems. It's been eight years since I first complained about this problem, and it's been three years since HB 2315 has been passed. I'm glad to see that the House and Senate are taking this situation seriously. I am asking this committee to please pass bill SB 5955. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right, our next panel, all the rest of these panels are remote, so I'm going to make sure you guys know to look out for your promotion. So up next is Brian Davis, Heather Morton, and Barbara McMichael. And after that, it will be Debbie Wagner, Philip Hansen, and Karen Valoria. Uh, Brian, if you're with us, please begin. Again, for all of our remote testifiers, please do make sure that you are in gallery mode so that you can see the timer. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning. Um, 
calling out my script here. My name is Brian Davis. I'm a member of the Burien Airport Committee, but speak to you today in an unofficial capacity as our committee has not yet had the chance to consider this legislation. An internal document produced for the Port of Seattle, the so-called Ramble Report, asserted the issues the legislation aims to address could be caused by air pollution and noise from nearby freeways or by industrial activity to the north of the airport or by what Ramble called social determinants found in areas where a high percentage of residents live at or below the poverty line. This brings to mind a time when tobacco companies insisted there was no definite link between cigarette smoking and all the health problems that research eventually proved were in fact directly related. There is no doubt about the noise that at minimum forces people who live and work beneath SeaTax flight paths to abandon conversations when planes fly overhead at peak times every two to three minutes. There is no doubt that aircraft noise in my neighborhood has been far worse since massive deforestation that accompanied construction of SeaTac's third runway in 2008. There is no doubt that a water district serving Burien had to shut down one of its wells because of contamination from airport firefighting chemicals that had leached into the groundwater. I'm well aware of the considerable economic benefits our city derives from the airport, but especially in light of plans to add literally tens of thousands of additional flights per year in the coming decades, I also believe it appropriate to acknowledge in a tangible way the sacrifices made every day by residents of our airport adjacent communities so that the Port of Seattle may achieve economic growth that benefits the entire region. This is success built in part on the backs of the disadvantaged. This legislation hey, is long thank overdue. Thank you so much. I, I, the yes vote. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And for uh, our remote testifiers, if possible, I understand sometimes we don't have enough uh, connectivity, but please make sure to have your camera on. Uh, all right, next up we have Heather Morton. Heather, are you with us? Sorry. Hi. Hi, Hi. everybody. Yeah, welcome. Hi. I'm a, a resident of Seattle. I live in Maple Leaf area. I'm greatly affected by the jet noise, particularly. I'd like to address the elephant in the room, which would be the capacity, the number of airplanes every day that fly over my home. Um, in the hundreds, I can't have a conversation outside. It's affecting my health, my well-being, my mental health, and my uh, physical health, I guess I'm learning about this particulate problem that they just um, um, let off. So um, I, as you can see me behind me is a window in my living room. I live in a 1929 Craftsman, a Seattle Craftsman. And these have large windows, as you can see behind me. Um, I can't think in my living room. Um, I'm doing a lot of investigation. Um, the airport seems to be too small for the number of airplanes that are flying into so few runways. The number of planes that take off and land on two runways, I'm hearing they only use, they only use two runways. I'm in com communication with um, an old lady up in Pinehurst, all the way up in Pinehurst, who's really, really suffering physically and mentally because of the number and the noise of the jets that go over her house and all the way up to Pinehurst. Anyway, um, so uh, yeah, just doing the investigation, you know, research because I'm really, really at my wits end with the noise in my neighborhood. Um, the software that is being used to land these airplanes are questionable. They are heavily concentrating with a high precision and high frequency, a jet path over uh, one neighborhood when maybe four blocks over, they don't get any noise. Thank you. Um, I, I know this is such a, everybody is who's testifying, yeah. you guys all deserve more than the 90 seconds we have time for today. Uh, I do hope that you will please submit your comments in writing as well so that we can get uh, your full commentary uh, to the committee. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Is Barbara with us? Yes, good morning. Good morning. I'm Barbara Michael, testifying in support of Senate Bill 5955. Um, I grew up in SeaTac 25 years ago. My husband and I moved with our tots to Des Moines uh, to live close to my aging father. We found a house we could afford uh, right under the flight path into SeaTac Airport, and we're told that the existing port package would protect us from the worst of the noise. When we bought, there wasn't any talk of microparticulates micro that can cross the blood-brain barrier, and I had no idea that the soil in my organic vegetable garden was likely toxic from aircraft emissions. Today, my husband's hearing is severely compromised. Two years ago, I started having seizures due to a brain anomaly, so my, our property and our health are damaged goods. 
as is our community's tree canopy, which has been decimated by support by airport expansion. I'm a member of the group called Defenders of Highline Forest, and we hope this bill could help preserve remaining local forests and expand tree canopy in our airport adjacent towns. Last year's commercial airport site studies in other areas were a bust. I get why nobody wants an airport in their backyard. But if Washington residents want to keep flying, if international trade wants to keep using SeaTac as the state's aviation gateway, then you all have to ensure meaningful mitigation for the health of my community. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So our next panel is uh, Debbie Wagner, Philip Hansen, and Karen Valoria. And then after that will be Denise Utley, Stuart Jenner, and Maria Bateola. Bateola. Uh, Debbie, if you're with us. Hi, yes, I'm Debbie Wagner, and I've been a long-term South and community member um, and have dealt with the port on many issues over a long period of time. But I think my most significant contribution has come from being an advisory board member with the UW team investigating the ultrafine particles. Um, I want to talk about how we got here. So in 1980... Congress passed the ASNA Act, which required port districts to draw maps and outline the area of non-compatible land uses. When SeaTac Airport drew that line around the airport of who was impacted and would suffer health consequences, there were very dense population center already established that would have cost them a billion dollars to clear out. They did not want to spend that money. That's my opinion. And instead developed a program called mediation where the homeowners would agree to stay in lieu of having treatments added to their homes that would make their living environment um, not so impactful. Now these this program was a requirement that the Port of Seattle agreed to because of mediating away the rights of the people to be removed as government takings and compensated adequately. So instead, they developed this mediation where they agreed to make these homes compatible. Now, consider I'm, I'm that. So, I'm so sorry. Will you please make sure that you get your comments to us in writing? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate I it. I support the bill. <laughs> we figured. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much for bringing in your testimony. I understand I understand Philip is no longer with us. Karen, if you're here. Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you, Senator Kaiser, for sponsoring this bill. My name is Karen Valoria, and I'm a resident of Boulevard Park, a neighborhood in the north part of Burien. I am in favor um, for Bill 59. Five, five. Growing up as an, in, in, as an immigrant family, I had a dream of owning my own home like every other American. When I was looking at buying a home 20 years ago, the Boulevard Park neighborhood was one of the more affordable options in my budget. The house had a great yard and on a clear day, a view of the Cascades. I knew it was very close to the airport and I saw, as I saw the fly, planes flying overhead, but one of the redeeming qualities that my real estate, real estate agent said is that I have double paned windows and heavier insulation on the roof. I had what he called a port package. After living here for 20 years, my port package is now failing. There's moisture behind, between the double pane windows that cannot be cleaned. And in this wet climate we live in, there is no way to stop it from molding. My neighbors and I do not have the means to replace all our windows and add more insulation. We hear airport noise every few minutes. I no longer grow tomatoes in my yard because I was concerned that I had to make sure I had to scrub off what I called airport dust off the tomatoes. I love my house and I don't want to leave it, but because I live near the airport, Trying to fill my American dream, it's making it harder to live a healthy life. Thank you for listening. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, next on deck, we have Denise Utley, Stuart Jenner, and Maria Bataiola. Uh, Denise, are you here with us? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Are you able to turn your camera on? Yeah, there we go. There it is. Okay, go <laughs> for it. For 
Thank you for your time. My name is Denise Utley, and I'm in the SeaTac area. Um, I received my port package. I started the, the installation started in February of 2000. We were involved up until that point in the negotiation process for a contractor to do the install. We were not involved in the negotiation process that the port had put forward to pick the producer or the manufacturer of the actual windows, but we ended up, I found out later, the, the manufacturer was Alpine Windows, who many of us had. So again, I just want to reiterate, my install started on February 10th of 2000. On, oops, sorry, on July 11th of the same year, a few months later, Alpine Windows and their parent company and all 11 of their subsidiary companies went bankrupt. That was like five months later. I mean, it's, it, we, we had no opportunity to, for warranties. We had no opportunity for any of that. I've had trouble with my window starting three years after the install onward. I have now paid personally 43, just almost $4,400 to have uninsulated windows installed to replace the ones I couldn't see through that continued to leak because I couldn't get help elsewhere. So I'm in support of this package and I hope that you'll vote for it. Thank you so much for joining us. Stuart, are you with us? Good morning. I'm Stuart Jenner. I reside in Normandy Park, just west of SeaTac. I am in support of Bill 5955. I've been involved in airport issues for many years. And what really struck me some 20 years ago was the fundamental unfairness of sticking the costs to residents of the area. Um, I heard some of the horror stories as I was involved, and I thought, well, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. And then I kept realizing, I began to realize, oh, these, this is systemic. This is in, I, I don't know if it's intentional, but it, it's happening all the time. Um, these people are having really bad experiences. I want to um, raise two words, asthma and windows. First, I wish everyone could taste the air this morning. 8 a.m. outside west of SeaTac. There is some kind of an air inversion from the cold air, and the air just tastes different. People need to have indoor air that is clean. They need air quality. My wife has asthma. My daughter has asthma. My, my grandmother died from asthma. I take it really seriously, and my hope for this bill is that it can reduce the risk factors. Second, windows. On Friday, when it was 20 degrees, I got a call from a former babysitter of my kids saying, please help, my window won't close. There was a problem. She lives just west of SeaTac, also in Burien. These windows wear out. People need help. Please vote for the bill. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Maria. Uh, our, our final panel after Maria will be Sarah Moore, Bob Morton, Kent uh, Pelosari, and Megan Slade. Uh, Maria, if you're with us, please go ahead. Good morning, committee chair and members. My name is Maria Batiola, and I chair the Beacon Hill Council. Um, I would like to speak to the racial and immigrant and refugee equity components of Senator Kaiser's um, bill. Environmental health and climate justice is about equal burdens and equal benefits. In Beacon Hill, we have over 40,000 residents with 70% people of color and 40% immigrant and uh, refugees. We suffer from three different sources of pollution, and one of them is the air and noise from SeaTac airport planes. We're under the flight path, and we get 70% of the landings that come to SeaTac airport. Uh, the public health study has documented the PM 2.5 air pollution impacts our asthma and respiratory system. My son has asthma. His father has just suffered from esophageal cancer. The ultrafine particles impact premature birth and low birth weight. And the annoying noise impacts our heart, our cardiovascular system, because it causes stress, sleep disruption, and mental health. And one of the studies we did in 20. 17 was on the top of Jefferson Park. Uh, noise was comes every 90 seconds from 70 to 90. So we're overburdened, and together with those living on their flight paths and so forth, there's over a quarter of a million residents. Please do pass and help the port keep its environmental and community commitments. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Senator Kaufman, <laughs> did you want to say? I just wanted to say hi, Maria. 
Oops, she's gone. <laughs> <laughs> she could probably still hear you. I'm Maria. <laughs> All right. <Hi. laughs> All right. Sarah, are you with us? I'm here. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for accepting my testimony in favor of Senate Bill 5955. My name is Sarah Moore. I'm a 20-year resident of the Boulevard Park neighborhood in Burien, living directly between two flight paths, and my home is insulated with a pork package. I'm a parent of two adult kids and an animal parent to goats and chickens, a gardener who tested my soil for Tacoma smelter metals before growing vegetables. I serve on Burien City Council, but today I speak as an individual on behalf of myself, my family, and a handful of neighbors in similar situations who are not able to join the meeting this morning. My windows are double, double paned, as, as are port, all port package windows. Where they work, they work. I'm calling you from my living room, which has functioning windows. They're all closed right now. Therefore, I'm able to call you. In this room, the air is warm on this cold day, and although I hear the airplanes pass by to my left and right, they're muffled almost to the point of white noise. You do not hear them. My bedroom and bathroom are another story. My bath has fog between the two sets of glass, which tells me they no longer have insulating value that they were designed for, and not only do noise and pollutants infiltrate, but molds will begin to grow unchecked, as, I, as I have seen in other houses. The window frame is also compromised with cracks large enough to allow ants to enter and leave the house. Ultrafine particles are smaller than ants. In my bedroom, a couple of sets of windows no longer hang squarely on their frames and can't be opened or closed. One is stuck halfway open, the other moves on its slides but is crooked and closes imperfectly. In addition to being awakened by the airplane noise, which easily gets through and wakes me, so do cold and hot weather and occasional smoke and presumably ultrafine particles. I'm so sorry, but your, your time has expired. But I do have a question. Do, in your uh, opinion, and as, as a city council member as well, would you say that the failing of these packages is because of the installation or the vibrations coming from the airplanes? Do you have any data on that? I believe that it is the installation um, because it's the windows that are getting used open and closed, and at least in, in my experience, that uh, suffer the damage, okay. which makes me think that it's just ordinary, and uh, we're not like slamming our windows around, uh, but just ordinary day-to-day -day use seems to dislodge them from their settings. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, next, we have Bob. Madam Chair, we believe Bob is no longer oh, in Zoom. I just saw that note. Okay, so Bob is no longer with us. You have a couple minutes to join. Um, Kent. Hello there. Welcome. Um, my name is Kent Paulus. Sorry. I was a resident of SeaTac for 14 years. Um, during that time, I did uh, a, a lot of... Uh, citizen research because I um, had two young children and I was concerned for their health. Um, during that time, I uh, I got an aneurysm and I got severe uh, lung conditions. Um, living next to the airport is the equivalent of two packs a day secondary smoke. Um, I did an international summit a couple of years ago and found out that 10% of the U.S. population is affected by just the top 25 um, airports in the U.S. Um, I did some uh, studying of 2.5 around the airport and inside the airport. The level of quality of air inside the airport terminal is three times better than the residents around there. Um, one of the things that I'm wanting is for uh, the, the residents to have the same quality of air that the port gives themselves. Um, we want uh, to have a, a safe place to live, to play, to work. And right now, it, it's uh, it's very dangerous. And finally, my daughter had a, a, a vegetable garden at the community center in SeaTac. And uh, after we got our carrots uh, uh, tested, we found out that they were not capable of being eaten and uh, this crushed my daughter and she no longer wanted to have a garden there even for flowers. Oh, well, um, I'm so sorry to hear you. that. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Megan, are you with us? I'm here. Good okay. morning. Good morning. Yeah. 
Um, my, my name is Megan Slate. Sorry if that's sick kiddo here. He wanted to join today. Um, I, I'm a Beacon Hill resident and I live under the SeaTac flight path. I'm also on the Beacon Hill Council Environmental Justice Task Force, and I'm here today supporting SB 5955 and um, really appreciate Senator Kaiser for bringing it forward. Um, as a parent, I'm really concerned about the adverse health impacts from chronic exposure to air and noise pollution in our community. My kid's school is a Title I school that has many vulnerable children and families. Um, and overhead is the SeaTac flight path. Um, we also are um, impacted by King County International Airport, and you can hear I-5 from the kids' playground. Um, so this cumulative pollution impact is being carried in our kids' bodies and brains, and addressing the pollution from SeaTac is really crucial to lowering this burden. In my neighborhood, there are kids that are living with asthma, brain cancer, neurodevelopmental disorders, seizure disorders. Our dog now has seizures. Um, I know many families who experienced preterm birth, which studies have um, linked to the exposure from ultrafine particles. Um, also, both of my kids come down sometimes in the night and let us know that a loud airplane woke them up, which causes a lot of challenge when you have kids who are not getting adequate sleep. Um, for many years, we've been told that our health matters, but we don't see any meaningful changes to address the harm. We look forward to the passing of SB 5955 so that our kids can grow and be healthy and play. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and for your young testifier for coming in and, and being part of democracy. All right, with that uh, considerable testimony uh, and a lot to think about, we're going to close the public hearing on Senate Bill 5955 and reopen the public hearing on Senate Bill 5970 having to do with the uh, Board of County Health. Uh, it, I believe we have just one testifier, and I'm sorry I didn't get you in before. I didn't realize there was just one. Uh, so we have Commissioner Mejia. Welcome. Are you Hello, still? You... Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Well, good morning, Chair and Committee members. My name is Carolina Mejia, and I'm a Thurston County Commissioner and the Vice Chair for the Board of Health. On behalf of the Thurston County Board of Commissioners, I'm here to offer my wholehearted support for Senate Bill 5970 and request your favorable action. As you may know, Thurston is a non-charter county, and the number of commissioners expanded to five in November of 2023. The focus of this bill is to pro provide some local flexibility. I do want to provide some clarification that Thurston County would be the only one affected by this change as Spokane County has a public health district. In compliance with state law, we have expanded our Board of Health twice since 2022, from three members to eight and recently to 12, in order to maintain the balance of community members and elected officials. Eliminating the current law requirement for all commissioners to serve on the local Board of Health will improve board meeting efficiency and reduce the complexity of board operations. We believe that the strength of the Board of Health does not rest in having all commissioners be members, but rather having the ability to focus on membership with those who have the expertise, time, and passion for the work we do for the residents of our community. Thank you, and I ask for your affirmative vote. Thank you so much. Any questions for uh, our commissioner? All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, with that, I'm going to close the public hearing on Senate Bill 5970 and reopen the public hearing on Senate Bill 6029. Our first panel will be Alex Herr and Paul Jewell, uh, and next on deck will be Bryce Yaden and Alex Brennan. Welcome. Good morning, Chair Lovelett and Ranking Member Torres and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Alex Herr, testifying on behalf of the Master Builders Association of King and Somish Counties, the nation's oldest and largest home builder organization. We are appreciative of the sponsor bringing forward Senate Bill 6029 to allow for rural residents to have the same flexibility as homeowners in cities and homeowners in King County. The housing crisis reaches every corner of our state and rural communities are not immune to the shortage of housing options and supply. As you heard in the briefing, rural residents are allowed to build attached ADUs, but not detached. In fact, the attached unit could actually be twice or even three times larger than a proposed detached ADU, but the smaller unit is impermissible and the larger, more 
impactful expansion is legal. Rural community members deserve housing options to age in place, allow for family members to live on the same property, or even create a rental housing unit to help pay the bills. We commend the bill to you and hope for passage this year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Paul Jewell, uh, on behalf of the Washington State Association of Counties, testifying in support of Senate Bill 6029. Uh, we know that ADUs have the potential to increase housing affordability by creating a wider array of options for residents. Um, the legislature has been looking at ADUs as a possible solution uh, for all kinds of different scenarios over the last couple of years to uh, address the housing crisis. This bill overturns what we think is a pretty nonsensical limitation on detached ADUs in rural areas as compared to attached ADUs. There really is a little difference between an attached ADU and a detached ADU. Think a mother-in-law uh, apartment that might be attached to a house versus a garage apartment uh, in a detached garage. That's really what we're talking about. Um, there are still considerations in this bill for water availability, for septic capacity, and, uh, and other health and safety regulations that are the same for detached and uh, for attached. We do have one small concern with Section 1E and its enforceability. It has to do with the one acre piece. We think that's a proximity issue. We think we could do it another way. We also think that the bill needs funding since it's a mandate. Um, Finally, I'll just leave you with this. The New York Times published an article yesterday highlighting the 50th anniversary of the iconic television show Happy Days. Now, what does that have to do with ADUs? Well, little known fact, you may remember, Arthur Fonzarelli, one of the, king, uh, the, the uh, show's main characters, lived above the garage at the Cunningham's house. In other words, the Fonz lived in an ADU. So I leave you with this. If ADUs are good enough for the Fonz, they might be good enough for us. Wow, that was an interesting way of tying it together. Uh, well done. Um, so, Paul, I was going to go with the A afterwards, yeah, no, but I don't know if I can do right. it as we, well. We're a little so. punchy today. Um, I, I have a quick question first, and then Senator Short. So, you know, my earlier comment about the enforcement issue, I mean, clearly there are a lot of these units popping up in rural areas, uh, you know, without the counties noticing because they're, you know, obviously they can't be everywhere at once. Uh, you just suggested this was an unfunded mandate uh, for them to allow for them. Uh, my earlier suggestion of potentially having a, a permitting fee set aside or something that's going to, to be able to get at that enforcement issue that I think, uh, you know, a lot of people are concerned about. If you could please speak to that. Well, you know, Senator Braun brought, brought up a good point, right? Whether it's a, a travel trailer park next to a house or it's a barn and then suddenly, you know, something gets built in the barn or it's a garage and suddenly something gets built in the garage. It happens all the time. It's basically civil disobedience because people are just uh, very concerned about the fact that they can't get these, uh, you know, they, they can't have a place for uh, a, a relative who's an adult who almost can live on their own, right, but needs uh, some help but wants independence or they have kids uh, that can't afford to buy a home now and need an option. Uh, so they really are building these things oftentimes without our knowledge. Um, when we find them, they're really difficult to enforce. You have to basically you have to uh, force them to rip out uh, the appliances and rip out the plumbing, and then they have uh, kind of a dry unit. Uh, and then we turn our back, and they go right back and put it back in. So it's this never-ending cycle. It's almost pointless to try to do. So we think that that you know finding a way to just allow them in a reasonable manner, uh, you know, that protects. Uh, public health, environment, right, safety, et cetera, is the prudent thing to do. They're happening already. Um, a permit fee uh, is absolutely appropriate. It should be uh, in this particular case. The only reason I talked about the funding is because it does require counties to adjust their, their regulations. Um, many counties uh, have basically created development regulations uh, that don't allow them because that was the law. So we'd have to turn all that around. So we just ask that that piece be fully funded. Or it could be permissive. Or it could be permissive, right? If it wasn't a mandate, then we wouldn't ask for the funding because then it would be a, a jurisdiction's choice to make that change. Okay, excellent. Uh, Senator Short. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, either Paul or Al Alex, what I, I'm still trying, I'm struggling with the difference between attached and detached ADUs. You know, as, as we're talking about the concerns, what, what difference in your jurisdictions and your line of work do you see? 
Do you see any differences between attached and detached? They have separate entrances, they have separate appliances, they have separate living spaces, they're separated completely in many cases. Occasionally there's a door, especially like for a mother-in-law apartment that might be added on to a house. You know, they may want a door for safety purposes. But if it's a garage or it's a barn or something like that, even if it's attached with a breezeway or, a, or, or attached with maybe an access piece, oftentimes uh, the apartment that may be built in there has an exterior door doorway that is completely separate from the house to maintain privacy. So we see very little difference, frankly. And I think from a use perspective, Senator, I think what we're talking about is the option to provide a little, maybe a little bit more independence and privacy you know, for that use, right? Maybe you know, my mother-in-law wouldn't feel comfortable living in the same house as us, but if we were to say you're 20 feet away um, in your own unit, you have some independence and privacy, you know, that would be a much more attractive option for her. And I think probably for myself too. Um, and I think in terms of, you know, the concern that you'll hear around like the environmental impact of such structures, the usage is the same, right? Like the, the water usage and the availability, right? They're all going to be about the same. Um, so I think, again, this is a right size approach um, to stuff that's already happening um, in many communities. I'm texting yeah. your mother-in-law right now. <laughs> Please uh, do not. You have never heard of me. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't hear it from you. Uh, and, and to be clear, and for the benefit of the public, we currently allow for attached ADUs. We are just making a distinction that you could have either or. Yes. Okay. And I think this bill limits it to one. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. Any further questions? All right. Uh, next panel is going to be Bryce Yaden and Alex Brennan. Come on up. I understand uh, Bryce is on deck to answer questions, and Alex will be testifying first. Alex, please go ahead. Uh, all right. Can you, can you all hear me okay? Thanks for having me today. Um, I'm Alex Brennan, the Executive Director at FutureWise. I am here to testify today in opposition to Senate Bill 6029 and to express deep concern about the impacts on the environment, infrastructure and services, and the quality of life in rural communities across our state. By allowing detached accessory dwelling units that are effectively a second house, but not letting that second house count towards rural growth targets, the bill undermines the core ability of the Growth Management Act to plan for growth. Mitigation for water use by these homes is not included in basin plans, and about half the basins do not have mitigation for permanent exempt wells at all. And these buildings will also increase impervious surface and the loss of native vegetation and further degrading salmon habitat. Increased rural densities will cause traffic congestion, leading to demand for new road investments at a time when existing transportation projects are already over budget. And they will also increase the need for rural services, including fire services, to address this increase in homes in the wild and urban interface. This bill will not increase affordability. There are no affordability requirements. The reason that we have a State Growth Management Act is to address these interconnected problems in a comprehensive way. This bill jeopardizes the functioning of the GMA, and I urge you to vote no on SB 6029. I have a quick question for staff. Isn't there a maximum square footage allowable on these units? That is correct. The maximum square footage allowed is 1,296 square feet. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Short has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm just trying to, I, I need to be honest with you, I'm struggling with the difference between the concerns you just raised um, in a detached ADU versus an attached. And then we're hearing bills on lot splitting. You know, there, you're still, obviously, we share your concerns. We want to make sure the growth is done. I thought it was unique in, in how this bill tried to identify, don't do sprawl. You know, it has to be close to the existing house. I mean, a, a, attached data user are already approved. So why, what is the difference in the concerns you just shared I mean, wouldn't you have those same concerns for attached data use or, or lot splitting for that matter? Sure. Chair, members of the committee, Bryce Hayden here on behalf of FutureWise. Um, I'm going to take a quick crack at that because I think there's twofold. I think the first... 
it's not up, sorry. Um, I think first off, when we talk about impervious surfaces, uh, the additional unit, now we've talked about it above barns, above uh, garages or others, those are already impervious, impervious surfaces. But if we're continuing to add to additional impervious surfaces by building standalone structures, there is going to be an impact to um, uh, water recharge and, and uh, stormwater. I think the other thing we need to be clear on is that, and I'll make sure to get you guys the information after this hearing, we do know that detached ADUs use more water than attached ADUs. Um, there was a number of studies that have been done uh, over the course of years showing that. And then um, connecting that to the understanding that the current watershed plans that was passed after the overturning of Hearst, in our opinion, only mitigate for historic water rights or water impacts. They don't actually look forward and uh, uh, address the increased demand that's going to be uh, included uh, as we increase the um, development capacity. And, uh, and the final thing I want to say just in terms of how we do it when you're actually planning for things like fire services police this just makes it so you're not actually planning for that increased potential for development throughout that um, and I want to make a very clear distinction that every urban bill that we have passed out of this committee housing and off the Senate and House floor has made sure that that planning has been included and we're exempting that for the rural things which makes no sense we have actively worked and the final piece I want to say is in terms of King County and matching what they're doing they actually include their detached ADUs as a part of their underlying growth targets so when they say it's 10 units an acre um, and you have a 20 acre lot you can put two homes there and they account for that so that's how they account for all the planning purposes in King County for their detached ADUs that was a very detailed answer I apologize and I will get you more information yeah you know, I think we'll need a lot more information uh, Senator Short Bryce we've had really good conversations I know we're going to continue to have those um, I mean to me if you have someone living in your home um, or an attached ADU, I, I, don't, I don't understand the water use issue. The, the water use is by virtue of, you know, the capacity of what's there. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm really struggling because you know what I see in my communities? I see people living in maybe trailers that aren't insulated. I see them living on public land. I see them in unsanitary situations. And I'm kind of wondering if we're going, you know, kind of um, really going after the perfect for the enemy of the good. And it's just, it really, it really bothers me. I respect what you're working on, the concerns you have for, for GMA, your concerns for sprawl and things like that. Um, but I just, you know, we have a housing, you know, crisis. And it's not even that. I mean, people, we're, we're not talking, you know, humongous homes and things like that. And so I really need you to address the water use issue. I need information on that. I also want to know why the water use would be different for an attached ADU versus a detached. Most of it has to do with the external use. Um, at the end of the day, those are the numbers that we're finding is that the external use to make sure that um, the surrounding vegetation and others um, are, are watered because you do have two separate homes is typically where the vast majority of the additional water use comes from. And that's why typically with an attached ADU, you're kind of living within that singular uh, plot in which there's there's um, you know a garden or whatnot um, and it's not perfect everywhere but I will definitely send you the studies uh, I believe I sent them to you last year but I will re-up them on top of your inbox by the end of the day well and I just um, follow up madam chair um, I'm just trying to think so you know um, a lot of my residents have gardens yep and that are detached and away from the homes that that utilize water they have livestock you know, and I, I'm just, again, I'm just really struggling. I think, I think there's good, thoughtful restrictions. I think that, you know, I feel are maybe getting at some of your concerns, but, um, you know, just really concerned about the direction on this. So I'd appreciate the information. Uh, is, is Alex still with us? Yes, I am still here. 
Hi. Uh, so I, I just have a question because I, I, I think, you know, there's been, we have put a lot of effort into making sure that our, our urban areas are densifying. I will say I have, you know, particular concerns around the adjacency of, of sewer systems versus expansion on septic. So these are issues that I'm incredibly sensitive to. But it seems like with uh, this ADU issue for, for rural areas, it's just been a hard pass. Um, I would just love to see some suggestions from your organization of, of how we get to yes. Well, you know, I mean, I think we want to continue working with, with the committee. Um, it, as I think has been alluded to earlier, we support attached accessory dwelling units because we think that they don't have a lot of the negative impacts that the detached units have. And I think that, you know, that's something that we want to get you more information on in terms of the, the water impacts, the impervious surface impacts. I think another thing that hasn't been brought up as much is that generally attached units are more affordable. You're not building the same amount of um, uh, external walls that need a different level of insulation um, and fireproofing. You're not building a new foundation. You're not building a new roof. So the, the costs are a lot lower. And so in terms of actually meeting the affordability needs in these communities, we think that attached units um, are uh, go a lot further towards addressing that. Um, and you're still then allowed the same, you know, the same amount of additional housing as I think one of the other commoners mentioned, these attached units are actually allowed to be larger than the uh, proposal for the new detached units. Um, but even though these detached units um, have you know, restrictions on the size, um, the the evidence from from where we've seen them is that they do have significant additional negative impacts. And um, so, I mean, I think you know we can continue to discuss those negative impacts, ways to address them. Um, I think a lot of the strategies for addressing those negative impacts, though, are going to require a significant amount of enforcement and oversight by the local government. And again, we've also talked about how difficult that is in many of these circumstances. So, you know, a lot of our concern is that, you know, we're going to pass something that would be true sort of in, in name, but in practice will be impossible to enforce. All right. And we're talking about 30 by 40 feet. Uh, Senator Short, did you have another follow-up question? Thank you. Actually, Madam Chair, it's a comment. I um, one of the and look, I'm I'm not trying to get on your case or anything, but you didn't answer the chair's question on whether or not you would work to try and find a way. I think it's legitimate to have the concerns that you've raised. It is, um, but the work we do, you know, we start with opposition. We start with we learn from each other. Bryce and I have had really good conversations I've learned from your organization. And, and you have helped me understand, you know, the challenges around growth and where you do it and how you do it. But I think, I think frankly, you know, to, to come up with potential solutions of how we can get there because we have people who reside in the state who are homeless, you know, and, um, you know, with all due respect, um, you know, if you add an addition onto the house, usually you're adding a roof, you're adding um, more than likely a small foundation. I just, again, I just would really ask your organization to come to the table and say, how do we get here? So really appreciate the comments you've made and, and the concerns, but thank you, Madam Chair. Do you have one? All right. Uh, thank you so much to this panel. Uh, next up, we have Jan Heimbaugh and Bill Clark. And our final panel will be uh, D. James McCubbin and Marnie Jackson. Welcome. I, I can go first. Hi, I'm Jan Heimbaugh. I'm here on behalf of the Building Industry Association of Washington, here in support of Senate Bill 6029. We do believe that all of our communities deserve housing, and this is one small solution to provide some housing for our rural communities. Uh, you, This is no surprise we're in support of this bill. This bill does have limitations on where these can go, how you can use them. If the concern is outdoor water use, let's put in the bill that these ADUs can't water outside. I mean, that is something that we would be 
happy to have this conversation. We also are a bit confused by the increased water use. Usually if you're detaching an ADU, you are removing a piece of the lawn or the area that you're watering anyways. And so um, we do need we do need solutions and housing solutions for all of our communities. In addition, the other thing that Paul Jewell did rep um, refer to is these units are getting built or lived in anyways. A lot of times people are putting shops on their properties which are permitted, additional um, you know, impervious surface, and they're not being built to residential codes. So if you permit these, you increase the safety for the residents who will in fact move into those, and then the code en enforcer comes out, rips everything out, and they go right back in. This way you're actually building these to code so that people can live in a safe and healthy environment. And the sort of other bonus is like way back on our issue is you're permitted. The county knows that those are there. They are increased property revenue as well because right now if they are not permitted, they are not part of the increased value. So it's sort of a win-win for everything. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Lovelett and committee members. Uh, Bill Clark, and I'm here both for the Kittitas County Board of Commissioners and also the Washington Realtors. Um, I think you obviously have a good sense of this bill from the testimony and the work last year. I would just reflect on um, Senator Kaiser's testimony to start the hearing when she talked about health care issues in her community. Um, the health care committee in this legislature has been expanding rural health care. The budget committee and EET has been expanding rural broadband. Um, there have been all sorts of efforts to help people live better in rural areas, but yet, as to housing and land use, we're not really allowing people to live there. And I think the bill before you allows people to do that in a way that's less impactful than building giant attached ADUs onto existing houses. The detached ADU product is less expensive to build. Many of them are modular and prefabricated. They're more energy efficient. They use less water. They use less energy. They can be sited in a way that's far less impactful and easier to add on to that property than making an addition to a house. So I know there's opposition to it. Um, whatever the basis for the opposition is, I think the significance of allowing this very modest step for rural housing supply is frankly just more important. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for this panel? Thanks. All right, our final testifiers will be D. James McCubbin and Marnie Jackson, joining us remotely. Sorry. Greetings from, oh, D. James, are you with us? I am. Zooming Thank in you. from the 40th, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is James McCubbin. I'm legal director and staff attorney at Friends of the San Juans in Friday Harbor in the San Juan Islands. Um, and I'm here to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 6029. Um, Friends of San Juan supports the establishment of affordable housing, but we do not feel that this bill will further that goal. Um, doubling rural density will simply create more rural sprawl. It won't add anything to affordable housing. We, we do allow uh, a certain amount of uh, detached ADUs here in San Juan County on an annual basis, and we have not seen that those contribute to uh, to rentals or to affordable housing. What they end up becoming are vacation rentals, uh, whether legal or illegal. Uh, many of them are illegal because this is not efficient housing. It's expensive to build uh, detached ADUs. It's much less efficient than apartment buildings or uh, ADUs in urban growth areas, and it, it's much more expensive for residents there uh, it requires them to have much further distances for transportation, for commuting. That in turn contributes to uh, added demand for infrastructure and police services and fire services, and all that increases greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this is not responsible planning, and we would really encourage you to vote no um, on Senate Bill 6029, and we join all the concerns that FutureWise has as well. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we have a question from Senator Short. Thank you, Madam Chair. So there was something that you, you that struck me what you said. So as far as like, you know, adding to transportation distance, you know, extra people, that kind of thing. But like if you already have someone living with you, then they're driving anyway. Like they're not, I, could you explain how you see, um, you know, how you see additional like, greenhouse gas emissions or transportation and things like that. Because if, you, if you're doing maybe a detached ADU for one of your children or a family member, 
and that family member is already living with you, like you're already undertaking that kind. I mean, the person's already driving to and from wherever they're going. So I wonder if you could explain that. Sure. And, and in that very limited um, example or situation, that might be the case. But clearly, there's a separate demand for attached ADUs versus detached ADUs. Or frankly, the building industry wouldn't be interested in, in expanding the ability to do detached ADUs. Um, it's a lot different having somebody um, living you know, in a shared wall with you as a homeowner versus across the yard behind the garage somewhere where you don't have to pay attention to them. So it's much more likely that people will establish um, a vacation rental or something like that in a detached ADU than they will in an attached ADU. And uh, that, that likelihood of increased traffic is just much higher with detached ADUs um, from, from our observations and experience here. Yes, and, and I will say that's something obviously I'm incredibly sensitive to and certainly, you know, the conversation earlier about making this permissive rather than mandated uh, hopefully would alleviate some of those concerns because certainly San Juan County wouldn't have to do it if it was permissive um, and maybe some additional sideboards around the use of them as vacation rentals because obviously that's such a uh, issue in uh, San Juan County in particular. Uh, all right, thank you so much for joining us. We have Marnie next. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Marnie Jackson, Executive Director of Whidbey Environmental Action Network in Island County. I urge you to oppose Senate Bill 6029. I appreciate and echo the concerns shared by Mr. Brennan and Mr. McCubbin. I'll add that the bill will have unintended consequences, effectively doubling rural density, increasing housing inequity, and creating a huge windfall for well-heeled investors while increasing the tax burden on poorer rural landowners. Property owners able to capitalize on Senate Bill 6029 by building and then renting out or leasing out accessory dwelling units, be they resident or absentee owners, individuals, corporations, or hedge funds, will benefit immediately and in the long term, while those without land or without the means to further develop their land will lose. The scenario may provide a golden opportunity for exploitation by hedge funds and other wealthy investors to profit off this bill, an issue already being addressed in the US Congress, but with a solution not yet accessible to us. In the long run, by increasing the profitability of developing rural parcels, the bill will increase assessed values and increase the corresponding tax burden on all rural landowners, including those who cannot afford to construct or benefit financially from a detached ADU. Economic factors aside, the bill will have a negative cumulative impact on wetlands and buffers. Counties will be compelled to allow new road building through critical areas because the reasonable use exceptions would accommodate this issue. The bill will neither address the problems it seeks to correct nor align with the spirit of the Growth Management Act. Finally, you asked Bryce for potential solutions. I do have ideas if you have time to ask. Thank you. I have time to ask, but let's make sure to keep it brief because we have two more bills to hear. <laughs> Thank you. I would just add... Uh, instead of this approach, I'd consider looking instead to a system where local jurisdictions purchase existing vacant rural lots and make them available for permanently affordable housing or a mortgage subsidization program to lower costs for low-income homeowners and renters in rural areas. Thank you. Huh, thank you for that additional information. All right, seeing no more questions, I'm going to close the public hearing on Senate Bill 6029. We have two measures left on the agenda. If staff could please uh, read in Senate Bill 5885. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Maggie Douglas, committee staff. Before you is Senate Bill 5885 relating to procedures for certificates of annexation submitted to the Office of Financial Management. By way of background, when any territory is annexed to a city, town, or code city, jurisdictions must submit three copies of the Certificate of Annexation to OFM. One copy must be retained for agency files, the second copy must be sent to uh, the Department of Transportation, and the third copy must be sent to the annexing city, town, or code city. Each copy must include a copy of the complete ordinance, including a legal description and map showing the boundaries of the annexed territory. The bill before you today clarifies that when any territory is annexed to a city, town, or code city, the jurisdictions must submit one copy of their certificate of annexation to OFM rather than three copies. OFM must then retain a copy and post its copy to the public website and notify WashDOT and the jurisdiction that the certificate has been approved. OFM must include a copy of the complete ordinance containing the legal description and boundaries of the annexed territory to the certificate. 
A fiscal note was not requested, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for staff before our ranking member tells us about their bill? I have. Oh, Senator Kaufman. Thank you. And um, thank you for the explanation. So previously, the three copies were provided by the applicant. That is correct. And now this says only one copy is provided, and the state must, within its own agency, share that information. So previously, the ter when a territory was annexed to a city, town, or code city, the jurisdiction must send three physical copies of the certificate to OFM. And this bill clarifies that they must submit one copy to OFM, and then OFM must distribute. I do believe there are additional ter testifiers in the room today that might be able to clarify the process. Yes, we have two testifiers from OFM, so they might be able to answer that, that question a little better. <laughs> Unless, all right. All right, Senator Torres, and then our, our panel here is the one that we called up earlier. So here they are, Katie Chapman C., Mike Mormon, and Carl Schrader. <laughs> Oh, and thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, Maggie, for that great explanation. And, um, and yes, we do have OFM here that will be testifying and be able to give more clarification on this. Um, this is more of a cleanup bill, and um, I think it's going to help streamline the process so that it's only one copy versus three, and also um, sharing it on the website as well. So I, I think this is very timely and much needed update as well. So thank you. Now I'll let our panel. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Lovelett, Ranking Member Torres, and members of the committee. I'm Katie Chapman Z, Legislative Liaison for the Office of Financial Management, here today to testify in support of Senate Bill 5885. Um, first, a big thank you to our prime sponsor, Senator Torres, for her support of this bill. Uh, this bill was brought forward by OFM's population unit in its forecasting and research division. Um, unfortunately, Mike Mormon, our state demographer um, who leads that unit, has jury duty today and is not able to join us. <laughs> so so you're, you're left with me who would have little less expertise about this process. Um, but to answer Senator Kaufman's question, question yes. Um, so currently in state statute, um, th we are required to have cities and local jurisdictions who are annexing um, provide us three paper copies um, of the forms that they submit to us. And we then have to send one paper copy back to the jurisdiction and one paper copy um, to the Department of Transportation. Um, in 2024, we feel like there's there's really not a need for us to do that. Um, this information is already posted online because there are other, um, other partners, including the Department of Revenue, the Secretary of State's office, who also need and access this information. Um, so it's an easy change, um, something that effectively we're already doing um, is an efficiency measure that will help make the process um, a little easier, save on paper postage um, and work um, for the agencies involved. Um, so yeah, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Carl Schrader with the Association of Washington Cities here in support of this measure. We would agree that the um, the underlying bill is is a, sort of a modernization of uh, some older statutes, and we support that. We'd like to uh, suggest one uh, we think friendly amendment. Uh, if you look at page four, line fourteen, there's a couple of other references to this. But when a city annexes um, a certain size of territory, you need to establish the population within that annexed territory. And in 2010, you used to be able to rely on the federal census as long as it had been released within a year of that annexation action. We would just like to strike the reference to 2010 and make that uh, ability to rely on the federal census within a year of its release for this population um, effort uh, to be an ongoing authority. I understand from uh, Mike, who's not here, that there's been some technical changes in the way that the census has been um, run over the years that would need to be reflected and that there might need to be a little bit of work to do some true up. We, we do believe that would probably be more efficient than requiring cities to go out and do individual um, uh, censuses of their own, which is what we have to do now. And that is a cost that um, adds a barrier to annexation. So if we can find a, a way to fix that am amicably, we would commend that to your attention. Thank you. Senator Short. Thank you, Madam Chair. So. Um, 
Katie, I'm just, so basically the information is still going to be available. Yes. It, so do you put it on your website then? I mean, is that what you do? So people still have access to the information. Yes. The access, uh, we currently have all this access or all this information is posted online and I'm happy to send the website. If people would like to review annexation information, I am happy to send the link to you. Um, Mike would have actually shared it, I think, if we're here today. Uh, so yeah. All right, any further questions? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing on Senate Bill 5885 and open the public hearing on Senate Bill 6061. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Karen Up, staff to the committee. Before you is Senate Bill 6061 concerning exemptions for housing development under SEPA. By way of background, last session, the legislature passed second substitute Senate Bill 54. One, two, establishing that all project ap actions that propose to develop one or more residential housing units within the incorporated areas of an urban growth area or middle housing within the unincorporated areas of the urban growth area and that meet certain criteria are categorically exempt from SEPA. Before adopting the categorical exemption, jurisdictions must satisfy the following criteria. The proposed development must be consistent with all development regulations implementing the applicable comp plan under the GMA, and the city or county must prepare an environmental analysis that considers the proposed use or density and intensity of use in the area proposed for the exemption and analyzes multi-residential housing or middle housing units within a city west of the crest of the Cascade Mountains with a population of 700,000 or more are categorically exempt from SEPA. And after that date, project actions within that area may, may utilize the categorical exemption in the manner provided for um, cities and counties generally. This bill requires that all project actions that propose to develop residential units or middle housing um, in a UGA must be connected to a sewer system in order to be categorically exempt from SEPA. The bill requires a city or county to prepare an environmental analysis that considers the proposed density or intensity of use in the jurisdiction's comprehensive plan rather than for the area proposed for an exemption. And the environmental analysis must include sufficient sub-area detail to identify potential development ceiling and impacts to facilities. The bill modifies the city or county consultation with the Department of Transportation related to impacts on state-owned transportation facilities. And the city or county may address specific probable adverse impacts to state-owned transportation facilities by including them in concurrency programs and subdivision and dedication approval process. The bill also provides that nothing in the environmental analysis grants a private party the right to seek judicial relief requiring compliance with the provisions related to the categorical exemption. And then the bill requires that after that September 30th, 2025 date, a city must rather than may utilize the categorical exemption that's provided for cities and counties generally. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, any questions for staff? All right, so this is my bill uh, with Senator Solomon. Uh, we had a bill last year that uh, essentially categorically exempted all of our urban growth areas uh, from anything more than a comprehensive plan level SEPA analysis and took away the right for appeal. Uh, as that bill moved through the process and as I've reflected on it over interim, thinking about some of the kind of inherent challenges to implementing this. One, making sure that we're not creating environmental challenges based on the fact that we're allowing uh, for potentially septic systems to be built within the UGA, et cetera. So that's why we want to, you know, make sure that it's constrained to availability of municipal level sewer uh, system and water availability, all of those issues. Also, it kind of left an unmet challenge around what happens if a local planning department is unable to complete this work during a comprehensive plan update. And if they're not, then who's liable for making sure that that work got done? Um, WashDOT 
uh, throughout the process had uh, concerns with the the kind of the, the structure of the bill because as an agency they have uh, some difficulty tracking all of the comprehensive plan update processes in the state at once and so to try to develop some concurrency around the way that the transportation element is developed with WashDOT um, in relation to fulfilling these these paperwork requirements and while I will say some of the, the more sophisticated and better staffed planning departments in the state uh, may have the staff time the resources uh, and the expertise to be able to complete this level of SEPA analysis in one go uh, I think that there's a lot of smaller jurisdictions uh, around the state that are not going to have the same especially staffing levels that are going to be necessary to complete this work in a timely fashion and considering the comp plan uh, process is already upon us and several of them are completing that uh, right now, I think it would be incredibly challenging for them to also manage to complete this uh, concurrently. Uh, so with that, uh, Senator Solomon, anything you'd want to add? No. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> took a we took a long pause on that. All right, we got 10 minutes. Let's try to get through this. Uh, we only have four testifiers, so you might as well come up. We've got Scott Hazelgrove, Jan Heimbaugh, Carl Schrader, and Bryce Yaden. Uh, play nice at the desk and figure out who's going to sit back for a sec. We didn't even have to fight. That was oh, I know. I, I mean, I would have loved to see some arm wrestling on this strange day, but uh, here we go. You always want to have the last word, right? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Scott Hazelgrove on behalf of the Master Builders of King and Snohomish County. We are signed in as other on the bill. When uh, the bill sponsored by Senator Solomon passed last session, Madam Chair, you and I had discussions at the end of the session about the need for continued review. We made a commitment to you at that time that we would work with you. The bill is before for us and we hope we can continue to work on this issue. So let me break down comments that lead us to others into three bins. First, on sewer. We had talked about this, Madam Chair, and actually we are supportive of language dealing with sewer. We think that there may need some, to be some technical amendments in terms of the timing on the language, but in terms of the concept, we have no objection. Secondly, in terms of the appeal, uh, we're unclear and would like to have discussions and work with you to see if we could get to a good intent. The idea is that we want to make sure this review actually does get done, but we recognize that there may be a requirement to provide additional time to get it completed. The third area with the Department of Transportation, uh, we are definitely opposed. This is a discussion that we've had for two years. The bill before provides special uh, opportunities and consultation with DOT. It also provides additional targeted review of the interests of DOT. And last year when the governor's office came forward, they told DOT that this would be an acceptable approach. We believe the way it's structured now gives DOT the ability to demand local governments uh, require particular mitigation. We think that is inconsistent with the approach on GMA and transportation planning and would oppose it. Thank you. Good morning again. I'm Jan Heimbaugh on behalf of the Building Industry Association of Washington here, signed in con because I like to be contrary. But um, I think <laughs> I think we can uh, get to like uh, Scott, my m local association here said we're probably like a con with an other and can get somewhere to make this work. We do agree the sewer connection and septic thing makes a lot of sense when it comes to the type of development we're exempting. So I think we can get um, with technical amendments to the right place on that and agree. But our concern. Um, continues to lie with the um, wash dot and transportation element of this bill and requiring us to, or local governments to incorporate the state facilities in their concurrency plan, what happens when one or the other doesn't happen and those things, um, specifically with our conversations over the last number of years about this particular issue, we are very concerned and would continue to oppose something that includes this type of language so that we can move forward and actually put growth where where we say we want to put growth in an easier, quicker manner. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, Carl Schrader with the Association of Washington Cities. Uh, apparently a theme here, signed in other, uh, but we uh, really support the intent and in what we're trying to do with this trailer. Uh, AWC and MRSC have begun to feel uh, questions from our planners with some confusion about the structure of the bill. So a lot of your changes on page two or all of them are very helpful. We agree the sewer thing just needs a little tweak because you know the projects will connect to sewer. They may not be connected to sewer. Um, 
we would think it would uh, submit it would still be very helpful for clarity to remove the new mandatory section from dot two two nine, which is an optional section. That's part of what's causing confusion for our members. Um, we are open to more time and resources and uh, clarity around uh, uh, the liability and timing issues. I think that's smart. Uh, we share the concerns with the expansion of the DOT language, and I just want to give you a couple of quick elements of it. Uh, it says that the review will be on the full development ceiling of the plan. The way that SEPA uh, and growth planning work is you have um, a, a series of assumptions of what you think will occur, and it doesn't mean that everything is going to be built all at once. So that would be an ex expansion. It also says that washed out when they ask for uh, mitigation that those impacts must be mitigated. That is different than underlying SEPA where you evaluate potential impacts and then you have an opportunity to consider whether or not the public good is uh, outweighed by moving forward even in recognition of those impacts. So this would mandate wash dots impacts to be addressed uh, more so than any other environmental or related impact under SEPA. And then uh, we think concurrency with wash dot projects is an interesting conversation, but that is a very, very large change to the way that um, we have historically dealt with state infrastructure needs and investments and having the local um, builders responsible for a portion of that would be a very large change. And so we think that would be a separate conversation, probably. Um, I am on the bill, but I did have a question about the provision around the uh, appeals and how can you enforce, like, can we expect cities to not follow through if there's no enforcement provision? And hearing Senator Lovelet's concern about this, this comp, cities under this comp cycle, can we have an expiration date for the appeal language? Would that make sense? I guess that's the question. Well, I'll just respond because I think we're we're the ones who that's intended to be supportive of, and we appreciate that. I think the concern that that would allow uh, um, no pressure to actually follow through is a reasonable one to try to avoid, and so some sort of timing or other way to uh, get us past this intervening point, but then have a clear expectation that this is what uh, what the standard is moving forward. So I think we could work on something to that effect. All right, seeing no more questions. Bryce, you're gonna close us out for the day. Welcome. Chair, members of the committee, Bryce Aiden here on behalf of FutureWise, testifying other, but in uh, much like <clears throat> my other colleagues, I think it's more from a clarity standpoint. Uh, I wanna echo Carl's comment in terms of where it is under the SEBA process, both from mandatory or optional. And that leads me to my second piece, which is what is a protected from appeal. So I think we understand the goals that you've laid out, uh, Senator Lovelet, and we support those. Just understanding what you're protected from appeals, what is required, uh, clarity along that, and I think we'll probably be pretty comfortable with the bill moving forward. Great. Uh, any questions for Bryce? So yeah, obviously we're on a constrained time schedule here. Would love everybody to put their thinking caps on and make sure to get me any uh, red line edits, et cetera, ASAP. All right, man, we managed to do it in just two minutes under the mark here. With that, I'm going to close the public hearing on Senate Bill 6061, and we are adjourned.